And let's say a big thanks to Jay Wood and the team for leading us in worship there again this morning. And man, it's awesome. You guys, come on up, grab a seat. And uh, as they're grabbing a seat, our panel this morning, finding a place, everyone's always like, I don't want to take the seat closest to Sean, because that means I'm going to have to take the first question, probably. Okay, but it doesn't work that way, guys, all right? Uh, hey, I told you we're going to do a few giveaways this morning, so we got a few names of some guys that texted in this morning. We've got a few t-shirts. My man, uh, Jackson Truett, uh, Jackson Shivers is going to help us out. Truett, I thought, was over there, too. Uh, all right, so we got... We got some guys here for a T-shirt, a Jesus One T-shirt. We got Bob Steinweg. Wig, where are you at, Bob? Raise your hand. Stand up, Bob, so we can find you. Okay. All right. Run it on out there. Let's see that speed. Okay. All right. Not moving very fast. Okay. Got to go faster. Okay. Here we go. All right. So that was Bob, and then we got. Let's see. Uh, Kevin Ownsby. Kevin Ownsby. Where are you at, Kevin? Right up here. Okay. Good job, Kevin. Get you a T-shirt. And if those don't fit you guys, just take it to the back this morning. We'll uh, exchange it out for you guys. And then, uh, let's see here. We got Jesse Lowe. Where's Jesse Lowe at? Way back there in the back. Okay. All right, Jesse. And then we got the four tickets to the Texas Rangers. Uh, I think they're – who are they playing there on that sheet there? I forget. Is it the Reds? Cincinnati Reds, I think it is. I think it's the Reds they're playing. It's on a Friday night. But we got Trevor – Brillman. Trevor Brillman? Where are you at, Trevor? Okay, all right. Congrats to Trevor. And uh, awesome. You guys are going to enjoy those and enjoy the Texas Rangers. And speaking of the Rangers, man, we had a, a big opening day yesterday. How many of you guys watched a little bit of that game yesterday, huh? How about that? It was a great game. Uh, Garcia with a home run. And uh, it was amazing. Mason, did you watch a little bit? Mason down here is our chaplain for the Texas Rangers. Been serving there for 10 years. Okay, that's it. Yes, sir. So big, big deal there. So, hey, guys, take just a moment. Uh, introduce yourselves, if you would. And then just uh, share a little bit about your playing experience, your, your experience in the, in the big leagues and, and uh just a little bit about yourself, if you would, all right? We'll start down here, Richie. That's why I didn't want to sit right there. See, I know. <laughs> I figured, yeah. That's what it is. I think mine's on. No, it's on. Yep. Okay. I'll turn it up a little bit uh, for you if you need to. Yeah, my name's Richie Hare. Um, grew up here in Plano um, and uh, went to Sam Houston State, went to uh, Plano Senior High, went to Sam Houston State, and then uh, played in the D Detroit Tigers organization, um, played in the minor leagues, was an outfielder, and uh, just went through that journey of uh, – Personal growth, um, it really shaped who I am today. So just going through that journey of failures and adversities and uh, helped mold me into who I am today. And today you're a golf pro, right? I am, yeah. yeah I'm a golf pro, director of golf, general manager at a golf club uh, called Trinity Forest. Awesome, so. awesome. All right. And uh, yeah. <laughs> My name's uh, Rocky Cherry. I grew up here in Coppell. Uh, played at University of Oklahoma with David Percy, so that was kind of cool. I was uh, a couple years older than him, so I got to kind of push him around a little bit. Um, I then uh, got drafted by the uh, Phillies my junior year and uh, decided I wanted to go back my senior year. Got drafted by the Cubs, uh, was in the minor leagues with them about four years, and uh, finally got my call up in 2007. Um, Shortly was traded over to Baltimore at the end of 07. Kerry Wood got healthy from an injury, and they traded me to the Orioles, uh, finished up with them in 08, and then uh, ended up walking away uh, in 2009. So, and uh, honestly, like, we all have stories of how perseverance is part of our story because that's the only way you can get there. So you said it well, Richie. Yeah, I was joking with Rocky just a few moments ago. He said he played for the Cubs. I said, man, yesterday was a tough day for you, right, uh, with the Rangers beating up the Cubs there. But uh, he said for clearly he's a, a Rangers fan, right? Yeah, Rangers number one, but if they're not there, which they haven't been very often, uh, the Cubs, which they haven't been there very often Right, I was going to say either. they hadn't been there a lot either. You know? I think I chose the wrong, wrong teams. Yeah. All right, David. Uh, my name is David Percy. Um, I also grew up in the area here, uh, graduated from Trinity Christian Academy, and uh, went on, like Rocky said, we played baseball together at Oklahoma. Uh, it was a fun couple of years there. Um, 
then I was drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays, uh, drafted by them in 2004, and uh, spent most of the time with them. Um, then I ended up getting trading from the Blue Jays, then I went to Oakland, and then uh, got went to Detroit, played a year with the Phillies in the minor leagues, and then was with the White Sox, and then I hurt my elbow, uh, throwing nine innings on five days, four outings, so it's multiple innings. And uh, yeah, like, uh, like Rocky was saying, you know, like there is, you go through adversity coming through the minor leagues and, you know, every little thing shapes you from the 13 hour bus rides to uh, having to, you know, double headers and, you know, all the fun stuff that you really, you know, you never see, you just see the TV pop on, you're like, oh, look, they're doing that. But uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it. So uh, yeah, definitely is, uh, is it was, it's been a fun experience and uh, kind of excited to be up here sharing with y'all. Awesome. Awesome. All right. And Mason. My name's Mason. Uh, I've not yet been paid to play, uh, but I got drafted by my son to pitch in our backyard. <laughs> and so that's where I spend most of my career baseball wise right now. That's good. Hang on. Hang on, Mason. So, 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 you know, you and I are up here. We're, we're the non-baseball players. OK, but tell us you've been you've been the chaplain now for the Texas Rangers for 10 years. This is my 10th season getting to serve as the chaplain, which kind of means I'm kind of serve as the pastor of the team, pastor of the organization. That's awesome. So uh, I would love to hear, you know, I'm sure these guys are interested, but just share with us a little bit, maybe from this past season, you know, what was maybe one of the things that just jumped out to you, stood out to you as a, as a memorable experience? And then as he's thinking about that, guys, I would love for you guys just to think about also maybe one of the memorable experiences from your playing career as well, you know, just something that stood out to you guys. Yeah, I would say um, something that a lot of people don't see is kind of the spiritual depth of a lot of the players behind the scenes. And there, there are moments that you might, if you're watching TV games or something like that, you might see a few moments where guys gather together and pray together. But that, this past season, that was probably the most significant thing I got to see and hear about is the ways that guys on the Rangers took deep ownership of their own faith, were seeking Jesus um, really drastically in their lives, Amen. but they would they would do that together. They would before the games they would huddle in the uh, in the dugout and pray together. Not all of them, but a group of them would gather and pray together. And I would say just incredible. I guess I would call it ministry that happened amongst the team. Really had nothing to do with me. I was watching coaches and players invest in each other, and that was really some of the most significant stuff I saw. Awesome. David, yeah, that's good. It's awesome to see, you know, we see that a lot, you know, and I know there's always, you know, guys kind of wonder, you know, I mean, how authentic is a guy's faith, you know, but man, it's, it's awesome to hear, man, just that guys are really living for Jesus. So David, what about you? Something that stood out to you from your, from your career? Uh, we've got a lot of different things that happened in my career. Uh, from, from the baseball side of it, um, some some funny things, just a random side note was, you know, Ichiro's, you know, one of the best hitters in baseball, right? Um, I was pitching to him. Well, the only game he's ever been thrown out of was I was on the mound pitching to him. I had a, I had a catch that framed the ball really well. I mean, he looked at it. He looked at the umpire and said, no. He drew a line in the dirt about that far off the corner. And he was, got tossed, right? You can't argue that stuff. Um, but the one thing about that was, as afterwards, I was like, you know, I really got to go see that. So I went in, watched the camera, had a camera angle straight over the top. The ball was that far off the corner. Like, it just, made, it just blew my mind. I was like, he is that good at knowing the strike zone. Um, stuff like that to me is just mind blowing that how good some guys can be. That's good. Rocky, what about you? So I was fortunate enough to uh, pitch at the old, uh, the old Yankee Stadium the last game. And uh, so I was the last visiting pitcher to pitch at Old Yankee Stadium, you know, maybe possible trivia question down the road. <laughs> and uh, the last hitter I got to face was Derek Jeter. And so that was an amazing opportunity for me. And uh, I remember I didn't think I was going to pitch because like David was talking about, I'd thrown four out of five days. So I knew that I was down that day. So I wasn't prepared mentally, physically, anything. And when the bullpen phone rang, I uh, 
you know, heart rate usually elevates a little bit, you know, and I was like just enjoying the atmosphere. And then all of a sudden they were like, Cherry, you're up. And I'm like, no way. Like I'm arguing with the guy. <laughs> and uh, my shoes weren't tied, so I tied my shoes, couldn't find my hat, my glove. I'm literally throw one or two balls and they're like, you know, manager's out, you're in. I'm like, what? You got to be kidding me. So I get out there, and uh, I pitched well, and um, I remember them announcing Derek Jeter coming to, you know, the plate. They're like, now batting number two, Jeter number two, standing ovation, all the flashing cameras from phones and all that. And, uh, you know, he got, he dug in, I got on the mound, and they got louder, the fans did. So I, like, nodded my hat, like, hey, congratulations. <laughs> um, and he actually said, thank you. He, he looked, nodded at me back and said, thank you. And I was like, dang, Jared Jeter just said hi to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was the first time also in my career that um, I was like, I'm going to let him have an opportunity to hit because I, I realized how grand this moment was. And it was the kind of like first time I was like, hey, I'm going to let him just have it. I knew I wasn't going to throw a fastball because I was scared, honestly. I didn't want to hit him. So I threw a breaking ball, and I happened to take just a little bit off of it. And I remember seeing his eyes, like he was like, there it is, I knew it was coming, and he swung so hard. But since I took some off of it, he ended up grounding out to third base, so I got him out. <laughs> but, you know, there's something that to be said about this is that I wasn't prepared, but I had prepared my whole life for that moment. And it's the same thing in faith, right? That we have to be prepared because you never know when you have to disciple with somebody. You never know when you're going to be called but home to the Lord. And so every day matters, and you got to take every day as the most important day, the last day on earth, and you got to focus on our Savior and apply yourself, pray, be in the Word, because you don't know when your number's going to be called. Amen. Man, well said. Well said. Well said. Um, so, Richie, what about you? One of, the, one of the things that stood out to you. Yeah, so uh, um, one of the kind of one of the things that helped me out the most was uh, was when I was kind of a miracle story um, how I got signed and um, you know it was a miracle I was you know asked to go do this tryout and so trying to get a plane flight couldn't get a plane flight I was like 25th on standby um, the plane was full couldn't get on the plane was sitting in in the terminal sitting there crying my eyes out going hey this is my big chance I blew it uh, I didn't get on the plane. All of a sudden, you know, if you don't believe in miracles or the miracle of God that, you know, that I'm up here just from from what happened was somebody got sick and was pulled off the plane last second. The um, the terminal lady that was working the terminal um, saw me still sitting there sobbing and somehow, you know, went against the rules and gave me that seat on that plane. Um, from there, you know, I took a cab to the field had my luggage. If you're, you know, a baseball player, it's kind of embarrassing. You know, I wheeled my luggage into the dugout and I was that guy. And, uh, there's a lot more people there than I thought. It was like 450 players there. And I tried out in front of them and was the only one signed there. And from there, you know, I'm standing there in front of ABC, NBC, CBS of Detroit and getting interviewed. And then, you know, the next day I find myself on the you know front page of the sports page of uh, the USA Today. For guys that, you know, used to read the paper, that was, you know, the biggest deal. Now it's, you know, all in line, but it was all, you know, can I get in the paper? Can I get in the paper? And that was, you know, was able to, you know, share my testimony and, and the story of how I got there. So it turned into a big deal and, uh, you know, thankful for God that, you know, I didn't leave that terminal. That's awesome. Good, good word. Good word. So just... Uh, Maybe, David, I want you to take this one, you know, just kind of think about in your career, obviously there's highs and there's lows, challenges, you know, how in your career when you face those challenges, how did you, how did you mentally, you know, overcome them? Um, maybe there was maybe a big challenge that maybe you faced in your career. Maybe talk to us about overcoming some of the challenges or adversity in, in baseball. Yeah, I mean, there, I, I mean, I've been through... Like, you think about it, you see it on TV, and you see guys play, and there's, like, everything looks great, great, great. But at the same time, you see that guy with a 6 ERA that's been up and down seven times. Like, th those moments are real. Those are people's lives. I mean, they're getting shipped up. You know, they, they come in, they call you in after game, say, hey, you're going down. You're getting sent tomorrow morning. You're flying somewhere else. 
and you got to go play there, and, you know, you're demoralized, and, you know, all those things. So there's all those ups and downs with, I'm getting called up to the big leagues, and you're excited, and sometimes it goes great, and sometimes it doesn't. I've seen guys go in and out, up and down, left and right, but um, at the end of the day, like, all those movements and all those changes to people's lives, I mean, I mean, me personally, like, that can be just demoralizing to people. Like, I've seen guys get, like, so sad and down and that they never bounce back. But the thing is, we have that faith in us, that the, the strength in the Lord, that, that we know that no matter what we do on the field, our lives are in his hands. And, and that's something to me that, that stood out because, like, growing up, I always knew the Lord, and I, and, and I was always like, yeah, I'm, I'm assured I have life with Christ and with the Lord, but um, the one area that I, like, I had ups and downs in was in trying to prove myself and saying, like, I am valuable because I, be, I played well, or, you know, I found my self-worth in being a baseball player who did well. Well, that doesn't work real well when uh, you can't get out of the first inning and give up eight runs, you know, that just, it doesn't work. Then, then you're like, I must be a bad person. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, to handle all those ups and downs, like really just, just, just my relationship with the Lord kind of grew and grew and grew. And then at one point I realized that, you know, my performance does, has no value on who I am in the Lord's eyes. Um, and it's completely separate. And so once I made that adjustment and I changed into, into that mind frame and that mindset, um, it definitely helped me see baseball as a game. It became more fun, and we can actually go out there and enjoy it. So those ups and downs kind of kind of neutralized for me, and it allowed me to go out there and play and actually perform at my best. Um, I actually at one point um, started putting John 3.30 on my cleats, uh, it says, as, as he must increase, I must decrease. And it just kind of put things in perspective of me that like, hey, I'm going out here to play, but it's not about me. It's not about me and my glory out here on the field. I'm out here to play for the Lord. So if, if I'm going to increase him, then I must decrease and it's make it not about myself. So for me, That's that good. was something that helped me. That's good. Amen. Amen. That's good. Hey, Mason. So, you know, David talked about some of the challenges as a as an MLB player, right? So you as a chaplain, you know, you see these guys. They're in the locker rooms. You're, you're probably seeing some of these guys that David's talking about, you know, getting called down and, or getting called up, right? How do you come alongside of those guys in the locker room and just encourage them and strengthen them? And, and you know, when they're facing adversity, you know, just share some of your insights of being in the locker room with these guys from a different perspective. Yeah, right? and I think the way you said it really well of, like, who you are is more important than what you do because when you're baseball is so much about performance and so much about like if I attach my identity to how I perform it goes all over the place and you guys it's the same for us in life like there's mo most of us in this room have no idea what this world is like but we attach our identity to the dumbest things sometimes which means we feel like our identity goes all over the place and so probably the way that I've walked alongside guys the most in that is helping them understand what they're getting to do now is not going to last forever. It's a temporary part of their life. But who they are is much more important than what they do. And putting their, their worth and their value in their faith and seeking Jesus. My, my, my big thing with them is I, I want them to fall more in love with Jesus than anything else. And so even in the midst of those rough times, Hey, how can you fall in love with Jesus more in the midst of it? Hey, in the middle of this trial or this challenge or this bummer, what, what step can you take towards Jesus? Because if you're not being intentional with that, you're going to find yourself stepping further away from Jesus with things you might turn towards to cope or um, relate with different things. And so what step can you take towards Jesus even in this time that's frustrating? You, got, you just got sent down to AAA again. You're frustrated with that. How can you step towards Jesus in this journey? And what, what, God, what is God maybe up to in this journey with you? What does he have in store for you there that you need to be on the lookout for? Yeah, that's good. Really, really good. So, you know, all of you guys uh, grew up playing Little League baseball, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, and, and you had coaches, whether it be Little League or middle school or high school or whatever, you know, 
think about maybe that one particular coach that stood out to you and maybe one of the, the life lessons maybe that, that just impacted you as a result of their, their investment in your life. So, Richie, what about you? Yeah, so my, my mentor was uh, Coach Steve Adair, was uh, the head coach at Trinity Christian. Um, I met him when I was, I came from a single parent family. My mom uh, worked tirelessly, so I was by myself a lot. So um, I found myself going to the batting cages in, in sixth grade, and, and he hired me to, uh, to pick up balls for tokens. And so I used to work in the batting cage just for tokens so I could hit. And and worked for him for you know until I got out of baseball. Um, I worked doing camps and then doing lessons, but um, helped build new facilities and things like that. But he he took me under under his wing and and was a father figure to me, um, a godly man. Um, batting cages over at PSO are named after him. Incredible person, but um, you know he could have just let me be you know who I was, but he saw something in me and was a great father figure to me and, you know, poured, it, poured his life and, and his, his family into me. So um, I miss him, and, and he was an incredible person, had an incredible impact on me. That's good. I know, David, uh, <laughs> Steve Adair impacted your life as well. So while we're talking about Steve, just share, share a little bit about Steve from your perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, actually, that's a, Steve Adair was my head coach, so I played at Trinity Christian Academy. He was my head coach, uh, kind of like, Richie said, I was like, I started going there, like, camps, clinics with, through him at, like, six and all the way through high school, and when he passed away my senior year, I was a pallbearer in his funeral, and, uh, yeah, I mean, he had an impact on my life in a, in a way that, um, that is just, it's, I don't know, there's, there's a way of putting it that he cared about you, he expected a lot out of you, but you knew he loved you through everything. And um, in my personal experience, you know, in high school, I was, you know, kind of a punk sometimes. And uh, he had a way of, you know, letting you know, hey, that's not okay. Don't do that. But he always pointed you back to Christ. And that, to, to me, that was the thing that stood out to me looking back at it now and being like, out of high school, I mean, I felt like, I could have gone two ways, I, I, and I know that he pointed me back to Christ every time, and uh, uh, like Richie said, he is just a, a great coach, a great man that loved the Lord, and he wanted that for, for everyone that he worked with, and uh, yeah, he was, he was a good man. Rocky, how about you? Uh, I had a lot of great coaches. I actually, uh, Coach Adair was uh, one of my coaches, too, in summer league, and so he had a big impact on me, but I feel like there was a lot of coaches in my life that deposited little uh, tidbits of just uh, goodness in my heart, my, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, but for sure, my dad was my biggest coach. He's actually here. Dad, raise your hand. <laughs> um, and I say that because I, I know a lot of people here are coaching their kids, and you don't realize the impact you're making on them. Now, I didn't want to listen to my dad. Like, he would tell me something. I'd be like, oh, dad, you don't know what you're talking about. And the coach right next to me would tell me the same thing. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, I do think that, you know, him showing up every day, um, him being that father figure, him going to my games, practices, putting that uh, time and effort into me, that had a lasting impact on my life. And he instilled a lot of the core values in me that allowed me to persevere and fight through those down times. And he was there through the ups and downs all the time. And so that was why he was my best coach. That's awesome. Mason, how about you? I, uh, I know you didn't play professional baseball, but I'm guessing you maybe played uh, sports in high school. And, and I actually played lacrosse in okay. college. And as long as you don't say soccer, you know. No, no it's just, uh, yeah. That's, uh, and I that's like an baseball. Inside joke with and I played Shivers a little, here. but um, I had a coach in college who invested in me more as a person than just an athlete. And he spoke into me in a way of, "Here's what I see developing in you. That if you if you were to like foster this and latch onto this and run with it, the." The way you're going to grow into a man who's leading spiritually is going to be phenomenal. But he, he was pretty clear. He's like, hey, the ball's in your court. You're either going to do this, and it's going to go this way, or you're not going to do this, and that's up to you. And I really appreciated the bluntness and the directness of, 
hey, this is, you're going to have to run this course. Nobody is going to make you run this course. And you're going to have to choose to run this course. And if you do, here's where it's going to go. But if you don't, if you keep maybe doing these stupid things that I see you doing, it's going to go in a totally different direction. And I think the value in that for me was a coach who cared enough to, in my life to go, hey, if you would, uh, let me change my language. I was going to, if, if you would um, get level-headed and really see where you could be in the future, it's going to make all the difference in the world. Uh, but if you want to keep being a knucklehead, it's, you're going to fumble through some things, and it's, not, it's going to be a bummer for you. Yeah, I got one more story for you. So uh, I like telling stories. Um, so at my last, uh, the end of the year, my senior year at University of Oklahoma, um, I pull into the parking lot. At the same time, our coach pulls in, Larry Koshell, who was at the time the all-time winniest baseball coach in collegiate history. And uh, when we went into, when I went into college, uh, we won the World Series like a couple years before. We were top 10, typically. We were a strong program. And we kind of faltered a little bit. And uh, that, probably a lot of that was on my shoulders being, you know, a junior, senior, one of the top leaders of the team and a big player uh, amongst the team. And anyways, uh, we both get out of the truck and we start walking towards it. And he's like, hey, Rock, I just want to tell you that uh, I know we didn't win as much as you wanted, but you became a better man. And that's what's important. And I remember I was so mad because I was like, I didn't come here to become a better man. I came here to win, you know. <laughs> And I was really furious. In fact, I, I thought about that comment for a long time in my life. But now that, you know, I fast forward, you know, and I've got kids, I'm married, and it was about becoming a better man. He, he was a big influence on my spiritual life and combining that with baseball. And now I see that his, his words of wisdom were true. And I see the importance of the becoming a better man is so much more important. Treat my wife that you know, well, and being there for my kids, and being there as a father, as a husband, as uh, teammates to my coworkers, you know, being a good person through God's will, and uh, everything that he's poured into my heart is way more important than winning. Amen. That's good. So, you know, we called this morning the greatest opener of all, okay, and obviously yesterday was opening day with the Rangers, but as we reflect on this Good Friday and we think about, you know, the, the, the sacrifice that Christ gave for us, right, and then three days later, it was the greatest opener of all, right? He came out of that tomb victorious over, over sin and over death. Um, how has Jesus' resurrection, his story, uh, molded, shaped you men just, you know, in your career and then today as a as an individual, just as a father, as maybe a coach now, um, how's that changed your life today? Whoever wants to go. Rock or Richie? I'll, I'll go first. Uh, so kind of the, the selfless act that, that Jesus um, gave, you know, on the cross and the whole, everything that, that he did leading up to that was, uh, was an example for me for selfishness. You know, my life verses, you know, number 625, may the Lord, you know, shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I, I took that verse because I was selfish. I, I wanted God to shine upon me and be gracious to me. And then when I finally learned what that verse actually means is, hey, have God shine through you and be a great example of a Christian and have God be gracious through you. Um, that that kind of, you know, bleeds into how the, the resurrection and everything changed my life because I was you know, going through baseball, everything is selfish. It's all about me, all about me. What can I do? And, and I picked that verse just as just being selfish and, and just going through my, you know, walk with Christ every day that it showed me, you know, when I learned the actual meaning of that verse was like, man, how selfish am I really? Um, and, and then the example of, of Christ, you know, doing everything that he could that was no example of selfishness at all. Um, that's, that's with the resurrection, you know, that I, I, I get out of that. Amen. Rocky? Yeah, um, so the first day of my uh, big leagues, uh, in the big leagues, I remember walking out of the dugout and just finally realizing, you know, wow, I did it. And just uh, them coming up and saying, what does it feel like to be a big leaguer? And I'm like, ah, oh, it feels awesome. And it really did, man. It was, it was a special experience, something I worked so hard for. 
later on uh, that night, I remember going to my hotel room and uh, sitting on the edge of the bed and just kind of pondering everything, right? And all everything kind of came to me, you know, and I was just thinking. And I remember sitting there and I said out loud, is this what I've worked my entire life for? Is this it? And I put baseball as an idol and I pursued it with everything I had. And it failed me in the sense of it didn't give me the satisfaction that I wanted. And I know you guys don't want to hear that. You probably all want to go to the big leagues one day, and I, I hope you can because it is awesome. But it was a great realization in my life that I was able to figure out that this world can give you whatever you want, it, but it's not going to give you what Jesus can give you. Amen. So. That's good. Yeah. I mean, I love what, I love what you brought up because... I mean, at the end of the day, like when you sat there at the end of bed, is this it? Like, I mean, really what it comes down to it, you come back to the hotel room, you fall asleep, you do it again, just like you were in AAA, AA. It's just baseball. It's just a thing we get to do. Um, and that realization is something that, that I had as well of just like, it's a game. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be played hard. But... And nothing compares to what Christ did on the cross. Because if he didn't come, die on the cross, and then raise in three days and live a perfect life, like, there's nothing. And just when you actually, like, we actually were starting to watch the Case for Christ of it in the movie with our kids. And just the evidence that stacks up against of that it's true, that it's true. Nothing contradicts itself. Like, when you see that truth coming to light, it's like... It just is such an encouragement to me to be like, you know what, we are grounded in truth. And um, Christ sacrificing the cross for us to give us eternal life, it, it kind of opens my eyes to the fact that it's not about me. It's about him pointing everything to him. And, um, and that was something that fortunately I learned in my career when I was playing. And since then, I just I wanted to carry that over past, past playing and... Uh, so we've actually um, wanted to, in some ways, kind of, you know, the impact of Coach Adair, like, we wanted to, like, we started a baseball organization to coach young kids and, and direct them not only as athletes, but as disciples and leaders, like, and so it's kind of like, it's weird to go full circle, like, of being a kid and being like, oh, like, when I got done playing, I was like, I never want to coach, and then here I am, that's what I want to do, and that's the passion that I have to help raise kids in a way that's going to honor the Lord, and it's just, it's insane how the, the way the, the, war, the Lord works in our lives and, and pushes us to serve Him and not ourselves. Yeah. Amen, amen, and man, it's awesome, awesome, and David's doing an awesome job with his, with his uh, ministry and his, his baseball group, Titans, and, and uh, it's awesome. So <laughs> that's it. And then, uh, Mason, what about you, man? Let's close it out here, and then uh, we're going to get Pastor Jonathan T. to come up here in just a moment and close yeah, this out. Yeah, for me, growing up, um, I longed so much for, like, a closeness with my dad. And I went all through middle school, high school, college, like, longing for a closeness with my dad. We lived in the same house. He, he was just real distant. Uh, he just did his own thing. So my whole journey growing up was maybe if I do this, my dad will care. Maybe if I do this, my dad will show up. And he just didn't. And so as I began to learn about who Jesus was, kind of late in high school, into college, and really started to learn about this, first, I think it was First John 3, um, something like, uh, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. And I started thinking about like this concept of God the Father. I had a disconnect between my heavenly Father and what God the Father really was. But when I, when somebody helped explain to me, like um, my dad just dropped the ball. He dropped the ball in my life. He didn't know how to pick it back up, but God didn't know how to drop the ball. And that God the Father wanted, wanted to do something in my life. And started to learn about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. My life up to that point, I was just bitter. Uh, I was just frustrated. And when I, when, when I surrendered everything to God and let Him lead the way, let Him be the Lord of my life, that's when everything changed, where I, where I discovered that I didn't need to be bitter, I didn't need to be frustrated. And in that disconnect with my dad... Uh, that was like a wound that was holding me back. 
uh, I needed to I needed to let God heal and fill those things that I was looking for somebody else to fill. And so when I when I reflect on like the resurrection, I res- I just reflect on a lot of hope, uh, ways that God has changed my life in the in the most amazing ways possible. Where now my relationship with my dad, we couldn't be any closer. Like he's we're best friends, and there's a there's something that's changed there, but it happened because God changed me first. Amen. 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 Hey, guys, thank you all so very, very much uh, for just sharing this morning. Pastor Jonathan Teague, I uh, wanted Pastor Teague to come up here, our senior associate pastor, just to close us out in prayer this morning. And so, uh, guys, would you guys thank these guys one more time this morning? Yeah. So, guys, uh, have a seat for just a second. We're going to do something as we go. Today is Good Friday, and uh, wasn't this good? Aren't you, aren't you appreciative of these guys? Man, such a great job, fellas. Richie, I was, I was thinking about something you said, man, about the, being in the terminal. And then, Rocky, when you talked about not being prepared but being prepared. And, and David, when you, my, you didn't know this. We didn't talk about this in advance, but this is, this is what Jesus does. My life verse is John 3.30. He must increase, I must decrease. And, and Mason, what you said about not finding our identity in the idols of the world, but in the living hope that is Jesus. And today's Good Friday, guys. And the scripture says in Luke 24, 5 and 6, when the women come to the tomb, Dr. Johnston, and they find that it is, and still is today, by the way, empty. And they see that Jesus is not there. And the two men there, the angels there at the tomb, say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And Jesus is our living hope. And no matter what terminal of life you find yourself in, God's doing something in your life today. Life is a journey. But God is working in some way, and he's teaching you what it means to be ready, to be a witness and a light for him. He's he's building something into you that's an identity that will last in his glory and in his grace and in his goodness. And look, the, the room is packed today. We've got dads and sons here. We're launching out into Easter weekend. We really got started last night with our young adult ministry, our gathering. Uh, the gathering met outside last night at the amphitheater. Young adults were praying, coming to, coming to faith and repentance. God's already moving throughout this weekend. Tonight, we've got Good Friday here at the Plano and North campuses in Espanol as well. We've got Easter services all weekend long, 15 all together in the life of this incredible church called Prestonwood. And here's the deal. Uh, I know a lot of you guys in the room this morning, but I don't know everybody. Many of you, your boys are with you here this morning. So as we go in just a moment to pray, I just want to say this to you. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done, there is a God this morning that made you and knows you and loves you. And the scripture says that while we were still sinners, say, what is sin? Sin is anything we do say or think that does not honor and please God. And guys, here's the deal. Our sin, the scripture says, according to Romans 3, separates us from a loving and holy God. It keeps us apart from him. And the reality, men, is every one of us in this room have the same issue. We have the same crisis. We are all sinners, and we fall short of God's glory. And so here's what God did for us that we could never do for ourselves. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came. He lived a perfect life. He never sinned, not once. And the scripture says that he became our suffering servant on the cross. And he went to the cross and paid the debt that we could not pay. It's the debt that every one of us owes, guys. And he paid it for us and shed his blood on the cross. And the scripture says that if we would confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. That's the testimony of these four men. That's the testimony of countless men in the room this morning. But i got to ask you before we go to pray, is it your testimony? Has Jesus come into your life today and changed you? You say, well, man, I was going to wait on this till Sunday morning at Easter services. I had a plan. I wasn't going to do anything. I was going to come to Friday morning, hear about baseball, eat, eat some tacos, drink some coffee. I'll handle that on Sunday. Hey, guys, we're not promised tomorrow. So I just want to say, if there's a man here this morning that would say, you know what? I don't have that living hope. I don't live that way. I'm chasing the idols of the world. I'm in a terminal of life where, man, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what God's doing. I don't know what kind of preparation I'm going through, but I know that I don't live with that kind of hope. So here's the deal. There's pastors all over this room, and there's dozens and dozens and dozens of men all over these tables that know and follow Jesus. Here's my challenge to you as we go to pray. 
If you don't know Jesus this morning, don't wait till Easter Sunday to get right with God. You can meet Jesus right where you are this morning because he's alive and his hope is real. He shed his blood for me and for you. And there's nothing that can keep you from the blood of Jesus when you come by faith to receive the free gift of salvation. And so I just want to challenge every guy, every young man here this morning. If you need Jesus, don't walk out of these doors without stopping and talking to one. I'm, here's, it's as simple as this. Excuse me, do you know Jesus? And I promise you there's probably a Christ follower at your table. They will stop. And you say, what do I need to do? Do I need to come to church more? Do I need to be a better man? Do I need to know more scripture verses? What do I need to do? You need to do what these guys have told you. You just need to stop. And in a moment when we pray at the table... And as we're praying on our knees in just a moment for the weekend and for God to move, maybe your prayer needs to be a prayer of faith for the first time. And you need to turn from your sin and trust Jesus. And while we're praying for God to move this weekend in our Easter services, God's already moving in your life right now. And when we say amen in just a moment, it'll be the first amen of your new life forever in Christ. And when that's done, you need to tell somebody at your table, hey, this morning I just asked Jesus to come into my life and take away my sin. And I'm a new man now. What do I do from here? We got you covered Friday mornings and beyond. We're going to walk with you. Amen? Amen? So let's do this, fellas. If you're physically able, will you take a knee where you're at? We're going to go this morning. And as we go, we want to do it in prayer. And I want to just ask you as well, if your son is with you, no greater joy, dads, for our sons and daughters to see us walk with Jesus. I see many of you men, your sons are here with you this morning. Guys, if, if you're nearby with your boy, just put your arm around and put your hand on his shoulder. There's some dads and granddads here today, generations of faith at some of these tables. And guys, here's the deal. I, I can't think of any sweeter thing under heaven this morning than men on bended knee crying out to God. So for just a moment, we're not going to linger long, but for just a moment this morning, in the quietness of this moment, would you just go to the Lord right where you are? Would you make that chair your altar right now? And it's got a little bit quiet in here, and as it's quiet, I just want you to meet with Jesus right where you are. Just talk to him this morning and tell him how thankful you are. Just talk to Jesus this morning in just a moment. Thank him for your family. Thank him for where you've been and what he's brought you through. And just in your own heart right now, if, you're, if your son's nearby and your hand's on his shoulder, why don't you just pray for your boy right now. Pray for your kids right now. Ask the Lord to guide their steps, to direct their path. That your son would acknowledge the Lord and all he does. Men, would you just ask God right now that he would make you, prepare you, as Rocky said, to be the man that he needs you to be, that he's calling you to be. Would you just in a moment of renewal, just ask the Lord in a fresh and a new way to continue to build you into the man that he's called you to be. Just ask him that right now. Lord Jesus, we confess to you this morning our need for you. Father, in our hearts, these men on bended knee in the quietness of this moment, we just we sense the overwhelming humility of this moment, Father. And we are reminded, Lord Jesus, of what Philippians 2 says, that, God, that Jesus, you did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but in humility you took the form of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. No greater act of service and humility, as was said a moment ago, than when, Jesus, you took our place on the cross. So, Father, we want to be your men today. We want you to build into us what we can't do on our own, Christ-likeness, overflowing and overwhelming. Jesus, the prayer of our heart this morning, as David said, is that you would increase and we would decrease. More of you, Jesus less of us, in our homes, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our business life, as a neighbor, a friend, in every area of life that you have these men deployed to advance your kingdom. Make us more like you, Jesus. Oh God, would you rain down graciously like never before into the services at Prestonwood this weekend. Father, we pray for our pastor. We pray for Pastor Connor, Pastor Huberto. We pray for Scott Turner tonight as he comes to give a word at our Good Friday service here at the Plano campus. 
Oh God, would you rain down in fire like never before. Sweep through us, Holy Spirit, in a spirit of revival that we cannot explain except it is by your hand. And Lord, as you do it, we will be so very quick to praise you, God. As you bring people to faith for the first time, perhaps even for the first time right now, under the sound of my voice, there's a man crying out to Jesus for the very first time saying, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. I admit that I'm a sinner. I'm broken without you. I need you to come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I want to live for you forever. It's as simple as that. So, Father, in the spirit of that simple faith, we go forward this weekend, God. We're going to be inviting. We're going to be praying. We're going to be asking you to move in our services. And, Father, we are excited and expectant for what you're going to do this weekend at the Easter services.